Welcome to Tail Learn Code. Here there will be tales about software development, learning from each other, code to build solutions. And now your host, Chad Green. All right, welcome everybody. So I hope everyone's having an awesome day. Um, today's a lot of fun. Uh, here in Roma, we'll have uh, Mike on here. But, uh, just a uh, couple of quick announcements. Uh, so tonight, uh, Louisville.net will be meeting, and we will be having uh, Matthew Perry talking about uh, ASA 2.0 and uh, uh, you know how to build better APIs using uh, those type of methods. Kind of interesting since uh, talking to one of the experts about APIs here in just a moment. Uh, so definitely check that out. You know, uh, just go to meetup.com, look for for Louisville.net, and you'll find that. Um, here, let me remember to close Pretzel so it doesn't keep on telling songs that it's playing you can't hear. There we go. <laughs> and sure enough, let's let's move over to our interview. Let me click the right button here. And there we go. And then I have to do one little thing. There we go. That should bring up my camera. There we go. Awesome. So uh, so I've got uh, Mike. Uh, I'm up. I always never know how to pronounce your last name correctly. How is it the correct way? <laughs> Amundsen. Amundsen. Oh, that's yep. actually not that hard. Yep. <laughs> Funny part, that's why I just always say Mike, right? <laughs> there you go. That's exactly right. So, uh, so sure enough, Mike will be speaking at Coppola's this year. Um, I'm not sure how many times, because you haven't spoken every year, but you know, probably at least five of them at this point. Oh, yeah. And it goes back, um, boy, it goes back to 2010, 2011, something 2000, like that. 2011, will be, yeah, which was our first year. Yeah. So yeah. Uh, that's the fun part. This, this is our 10th year. Uh, uh, crazy year to try to figure out what to do in your tenth year when, when, <laughs> when you have a pandemic. But uh, no, it's an anniversary. Yeah. So we're we're still trying to figure out what you know. We're, we're gonna we have some surprises coming up that we've been working on. Things we could still do while it's all online. Um, but things to to celebrate. You know, with with it being the tenth year. Um, but no, it, it's great. And, and the and the cool part is and. The thing you learn about running an event, so uh, I mean, sure enough, I mean, you know, Mike, you're, you're internationally known. You speak all over the world, but you live two hours north of the city, you know, or northwest, exactly right. northeast of the city. So it's not like you even come from that that far. Uh, yeah, yeah, which is which is awesome. Yeah. So I mean, let's start off with with a general question. You know, so I mean, how how's everything going for Mike with the pandemic? You know, how, how's your life different? Yeah, so you know, we were talking a little bit be, be, before the before the start of the interview. It's definitely a change of lifestyle. So I spent the last uh, uh, ten years or so traveling pretty heavily. Um, Forty weeks a year would be a typical year for me. I would cut back to thirty weeks a year when I was really uh, slacking. So uh, that's a lot of travel, a lot of international travel. Um, it's it's bad. You know, you're in trouble when the uh, the people who park pick you up at the parking lot, know you by your first name, right? That's at the airport. That's, that's really bad. But um, this is, so this has been a huge change. And um, surprisingly, it wasn't actually that difficult to adjust to. Um, uh, I'm pretty adaptable. So it was like, okay, well, we can't do that. What are we going to do instead? So I, uh, like so many thousands of others, uh, trainers, consultants, uh, speakers, you know, investing in cameras and lights and recording and trying to learn OBS or, you know, some software. So I've been keeping very, very busy. Um, I'm very lucky. I've got a few very, uh, very loyal customers who have continued to want my services. You know, a lot of stuff dried up. I had a lot of events just completely disappear off my off my schedule. So uh, in the main, it's good. I get to stay home. Um, I'm driving my family a little nuts. They're, they're like, get out of the kitchen. You're in the way. <laughs> Don't you have some place to go, kind of thing? But uh, overall, I'm adjusting to it and enjoying it quite a bit. The fun part is, I think it's the other way around. My family's driving me nuts. <laughs> <laughs> hey, listen, I, I, I love that that I'm in the same hotel all the time now. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, I mean, uh, so I've told, I mean, people who are nor who are regulars to the uh, to this channel know that you know, I work I work from home. All right, and, and from you know since before the company I work for is actually 100 uh, percent uh, virtual. Uh, we don't even have an office, and uh, so that part didn't change for me. But like when my daughter came home from Boston, all right, yeah, you know, because uh, she, she's a grad student up there, yeah, you know, that was where the difference was. And, and now she kind of drives me crazy because 
Yeah, it was bad early on when she was here while she was still in class. And, uh, you know, I, of course, I was used to sitting here working and music blaring. And she's, uh, like, she's like, Dad, you know, I'm in class. You're making too much noise. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I said, well, like, I'm like, well, this is you know, my we house. We have some of that here. My, my son now works from home. He worked he worked in the Cincinnati office. He's actually a geospatial database engineer. Oh, okay. Does a lot of really cool things with cell towers and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. So, But now he's working from home. And for quite a while, we had rooms next to each other. So, you know me, you've seen me in person. I talk loud, I'm boisterous. <laughs> so I'm yelling into the microphone, teaching a class or doing whatever. He's right next door trying to hold a meeting with the FCC. <laughs> I definitely got the same kind of feedback, which is you need to tone it down, old man. <laughs> so yeah, there are adjustments. Yeah, no, it's, it's uh, so I guess, I guess though you're, you're getting pretty, uh, pretty used to it. You know, so yeah. Coppola's being online, uh, you're, you're getting kind of used to that. It's interesting. Yeah. I, actually, I actually have not presented online yet. Uh, I mean, I've been doing really? a lot of this, right? You know, uh, and coding online, but I haven't done an actual formal presentation. I will be soon. Um, yeah. I mean, I haven't announced, uh, I, I've got some things I'm working with some folks, but, uh, but everything I've announced so far is in October. Uh, October also actually, became a very busy month for me. <laughs> yeah, but... I've actually changed my whole presentation style. Like it's it's graduated over the last couple of months, but it's really morphed uh, now that it's all online. Mm -hmm. I've changed the changed the length of my material. I've changed even the composition of my slides, the order of events, all sorts of other things to kind of adjust to this online medium to beat a little bit of this screen fatigue that yeah, everybody exactly. deals with. Let people get up out of their chair. It's really been a challenge. It's been a, I enjoy these kinds of challenges, but it's really been a challenge to kind of rethink the way you need to communicate, communicate and be successful. So much of what I do is me being in the room. Like I used to, you know, basically work on the notion that no, 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 you want me there. Don't just buy a book. Don't just buy a video. Exactly. You want me there. Now I can't be there. So it's been a, it's, it's been a challenge in that respect. Right. Yeah. Well, that was, that was one of the challenges building the schedule for Copalooza. We were, you know, we were, we were like, how long of a break do we do? You know, uh, yeah. your, your first song is, oh, we get we get we could do twelve hours straight of, of, of sessions, right? And you know, it, it, which to me sounds awesome, right? I love that, right? You know, it's uh, yeah. so uh, you know, I'm an MVP, a Microsoft MVP, and at the summit, it was great, you know, because they they split it, ha you know, half day for you yeah. know for basically U.S. and half day for every, the rest of the world. Well, to me, I, I I just went to two half days, right? <laughs> It, yeah. it, I was in sessions from like eight o'clock in the morning until you know eight o'clock at night, and I loved it. Uh, yeah. But in reality, most people uh, that's that's insane. It's actually not really good for me either. Yeah, it, but, it's, uh, it's really really tough. I I noticed um, because I've done a couple of different platforms. I've done the O'Reilly platform and the GoTo platform and a couple others where they do a lot of this mm -hmm. and they give you some tracking things. Um, you can see things like after the first hour, what the drop off rate is or or uh, people coming back, you know, the second day, there's not as many as the first day. You sort of notice these things and you start to get this evidence early on mm -hmm. that it's not the same as when you're in a room and you're sitting next to people and you get direct eye contact. Yeah. So it's definitely a challenge. Yeah, yeah that's so, why, I, but, you know, it's like everything else, you know. Give it a shot. Let's go. Let's try. It. Well, that's why, and we're we're work, you know, we're working on some things. I, I, borrowing from other things I've seen people do, uh, but uh, and that was why it was a big deal that we have recordings available afterwards, right? And we we told people, yeah. like, hey, because on top we're we're doing twelve sessions an hour, right? And, and uh, so the great part, is, I mean, the the great part about going online is that I can now yeah. people. Well, I know for a fact it's going to be recorded. I'm not, you know, I know how they record this thing. Not like. And we tried recording uh, sessions at, at Coppola's before, and it was a complete failure, right? We we were having audio uh, mix, you know, so we were having, like, someone else's talk over someone else. Sure, <laughs> sure. It, it, uh, in, in so many ways, this has now actually made it, I mean, you you do this as a living, I mean, for a living. You do organization and, and talks and all this, the logistics. But in some ways, it's easier, right? Because... Mm -hmm. You have to be on an online platform. You have to have the ability to record sort of as a as a ticket of entry kind of thing. Yep. Whereas in the past, you were paying so much extra oh, yeah. to get all those other people online, right? And then coordinate all that and then all the post-production work. So in the, in those ways, in in, in those, those ways, it's actually better for us, for us oh, right yeah. now, right? No, a perfect example. I mean, like, uh, so this is the fourth uh, interview I've done, you know, uh, so yeah. it was easy to do these. And then it was so easy to, oh, okay, now I need to post on YouTube, right? And no big deal. I mean, 
Honestly, the biggest constraint I have is because I'm a Twitch affiliate, I have to wait 24 hours to post it. <laughs> really? But, but YouTube makes it easy, too, because I, I go ahead and put it in there, and I can say, okay, don't don't uh, don't make it available until such and such yeah. time. You know, and that, that way I don't violate uh, Twitch uh, uh, TOSs and... Yeah. Uh, but still making it public available. And, and the great part is actually Twitch. It's, it's available on Twitch the moment it's done. Yeah. So you, you can go on Twitch right away and, and see it. It's just, uh, that, yeah. but they, they yeah. want that 24 hours of exclusivity on, on anything. Um, yeah. And, uh, but uh, it's cool. So sure, I mean, talking about uh, Copalooza, right? So uh, yeah. I, I was really intrigued by, by the talk you, you uh, submitted. Um, so Postman has become like one of my favorite tools. All right. Yeah. Uh, so, so I mean, I'm a, I'm a backend developer, right? That's, that's what I do. I, I've told people you do not want me developing your front ends. You know, <laughs> it, 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 it won't look right. You know, you got to remember, I learned how to build them in the old Windows days. So Banish Gray was my friend. Right? <laughs> <laughs> so, times New Roman black on white background. Exactly. 12 <laughs> points, right? I mean, you know, times, yeah, exactly. No, it's... <laughs> but uh, um, so Postman has, has become my friend, right? You know, as we we do more in rest. But I've learned I don't know how to do half the stuff you you do with it. <laughs> and so that's why it was so awesome to see. You know, so and so sure enough, I mean, you're going to be talking about how to test APIs using Postman yeah. uh, and Newman. So, so talk. I mean, what are people going to get? I mean, other than what the title says. I mean, what, what are people going to get out of that talk? I, yeah. So so th this talk is actually. Um, a slice of uh, a chapter out of a new book I just completed. I just did uh, you know content complete and it's in review. And that's the design and build great web APIs book with Pragmatic. So I wanted to kind of go through the whole life cycle from the very initial request through designing and building and sketching and prototyping and testing and securing and deploying. So this is the test piece. And I think one of the things that I really like about the Postman system is it's really a platform. It's not just a library like ChaiJS or Cucumber or something like that, which are very, very powerful. I, I love BDD as a testing mm -hmm. uh, uh, sort of like way of thinking. But Postman is really a platform. So uh, when, you, when you work in Postman, it's really easy to script. It's almost like, this may be a bad analogy, but it's almost like Node.js for test. So I have all of the libraries, request libraries, um, UI libraries, HTTP libraries, testing assertions, all this other stuff built in for free. So I, I'm kind of like you. I'm a back-end person. And that means uh, for me, not only are my UIs terrible, but I'm a code jockey. If I think, I think in code. Mm -hmm. Even worse, I'm older than that. I think in XML then code. But that's a, that's a, that's a different problem. But so I But love that is a problem. <laughs> if you're thinking in XML, you've got a problem. <laughs> I got a big problem. We had a big problem. That, but I love being able to write in the in the on the Postman platform. So one of the things that I cover in the talk is actually creating your own private library. Like you know, they come shipped with uh, ChaiJS and BDD and all these other bits bits for free. But then I write another library that makes it easier for me, so I can actually you know spit off uh, assertions really fast, tests really quickly. So I talk about how to use your own library, how to insert it into uh, the global space. The other thing that's really amazing about Postman, which I'll touch on in the talk, is it's really now become a, a platform beyond just testing. So I can do mocks in Postman. I can actually do design work in Postman. I can uh, generate um, I can generate open API in Postman. So there's a whole bunch of other things going on now and of course, people use Postman collections as your sort of validator. You ship them with a with an API, so that you know here's the Postman to make sure that everything's working. So it's an amazing platform. So we'll touch on that uh, Postman in particular, and then I do another thing um, called SRTs, which is like a simple request testing, basically sort of scripted curl. And that's sort of what I do every time I write code and save. I'll run my little scripted test because sometimes Postman tests can get kind of long. Um, and, and but I, you can run these uh, simple tests in you know tens of milliseconds. So mm -hmm. so we'll talk about these these simple tests. We'll talk about Postman in general. Then we'll talk about actually programming Postman. And then the last thing which you mentioned is Newman, uh, is is actually the local runner. So I don't even have to be I don't even have to be uh, running Postman UI. I can just run it locally, and I can use that inside my deployment script. So there's lots of space inside Postman that, that will. Yeah. Uh, like I said, I, I think it's going to be a great talk, and 
And I, I think a lot of people will get a lot out of that. It's a, it's a definitely a fun one. It's definitely fun. So, so sure enough, I mean, next thing I was going to bring up, what, what, so your book, uh, which not your first book, you've, you've written a couple or you've co-authored a couple. Yeah. Uh, uh, um, so that's, that's exciting. I mean, uh, I, I, I know a lot of people have written books. Um, I've actually been approached to write a book and I decided not to. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> well, I, just, I was like, uh, I already do enough things. <laughs> the last thing I need is to try to write a book. That's, that's probably right. <laughs> yes. that's, that's probably right. But I recommend everybody do it. I really, 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 really do. You know so much about so many things that, that you know, that your unique is so, exper- you know, your experience is so unique. Mm-hmm. I think I'd, I'd love to read what you write. I'm, <laughs> I'm being honest. Yeah, I, 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 I did think about it eventually, but, uh, um, you know, uh, well, as, uh, as we were talking about before, uh, before we started streaming, I mean, you know, this year I was, I was trying to do more events, right? I, I started yeah. a new company and with the whole idea of doing more local events, uh, uh, so that's part of, you know, that, that was at the same time I was doing that when I was approached. Um, and I can't even yeah. remember which, I have to look at which uh, publisher it was approached me. But, uh, um, and I was kind of like, eh, you know, may, maybe now is not the right time as I'm trying to do all these other things. Um, yeah. I mean, but so much you, yeah. So anyway, I think um, it's become a way for me to kind of think and work out mm-hmm. and puzzle and I encourage anybody to do that. Sometimes you don't need you don't need the burden of of a cover and an editor. You, maybe it's just blogging. Sure. You know, maybe it's just you know writing long medium posts or whatever. But everybody's got their view of the world that's unique. Every time I meet anybody, every time I talk to you, every year I get to talk to you, I learn something new. So I always encourage people to figure out how you can sort of scale that, leverage that. Your whole platform here. This 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 coding online and everything that's a fantastic. Uh, hold on a second, I'm uh, I'm in a weird message in Skype. I'm not sure everyone else can hear you. Go ahead and say something. One two three. One two three. Yeah. Okay. Uh. No. Okay. Yeah. No. You're. It's weird. Skype is telling me that it's not sharing your sound anymore. Oh no, I know what it's saying. You're not hearing sounds from my system right now. Yeah, that's, yeah. That's what the message is saying. All right, no big deal. Yeah, no big deal. <laughs> All right, sorry about that. But no, I, I mean, I get your your sound sharing stopped working due to an unexpected error. I'm like, oh, okay. Uh. <laughs> wow. No, now I know what it was saying. Though. All right, sorry about that. Cool. All right, no, no, that's good. That's good. That's good. That's good. Yeah, yeah. But I mean, I mean, you think about it. You publish, you publish all the time, right? Yeah. Twitch, everything that you do. That's mm-hmm. that's fantastic. See that one's easier because I don't have. I just I just talk. <laughs> there you go. That's all. That's all you need. Yep. That's all you need. So uh, I need an editor. I need I need an editor between me and the rest of the world. <laughs> you don't. <laughs> I probably should have an editor sometimes. Uh, I, I, I got to admit, you know, um, definitely a progression of my career. Right. Ten years ago, you didn't want me just speaking. You know, because because <laughs> you know I you know I, I was I was definitely more of a hothead. Uh, you know, it's yeah. when I moved to management, it, it was so funny. I moved to management. It was about 10 years ago, or about eight years ago. I moved to management and, uh, um, about a year afterwards, I was talking to a friend of mine who, who actually, who was much higher than I was. And, and he was like, he was telling me, he's like, I'm surprised that it's worked so well for you. Right. You, you move into management. I didn't think it was going to work. And I'm, and I'm <laughs> I sat there like, what, you think I was going to fail her or what? He's like, no, do you realize how much of a hothead you were? <laughs> I'm like, I've seen, he's like, I've seen you blow up and you can't do that as a manager. And I'm, and, uh, and I'm like, well, I kind of, I kind of learned how to chill out. Right. <laughs> it's, yeah. I mean, I, I guess people, if you, you know, if you're paying attention, you get to adjust, right. You get mm-hmm. to adapt. That's really a big part of it. I will be, I, you know, I, I'm the first to say there are times when I miss clues, like, you know, I'm not paying attention. I'm too much in my own brain. Yeah. So, so that's definitely a danger. But if you're paying attention, yeah, it works out great. I never, I mean, I, I didn't know you a lot, but I knew you all the way back from the, you know, the beginning of uh, Code Palooza. I never thought of you a hothead at all. So uh, it doesn't surprise me at all that you would be a great leader. Well, co- co- uh, honestly, running run a, a, a conference has helped a lot with that, right? It's, really? Yeah. Why, why do you say that? That's interesting. Why do you say that? Uh, it's well, not because, made it worse. It's made it easier. Why? Well, just because of what you learn running a conference, right? I mean, you know, it's 
I mean, all of a sudden you're managing, you know, I'm managing a hundred some odd speakers. I'm managing uh, a dozen vendors, you know, uh, with the people that they work, you know, have working for them, uh, you know, trying to make everyone have plus 500 to 900 uh, attendees over the years. Right. You got to feed them. You got to close. Exactly. You got to give them swag. Yeah. Yeah. And and, uh, and of course the funny part is, is really learning, especially speakers, really learning the different speakers and how each of the speakers tick. You know, so like on, on the stream a couple of weeks ago when we were building a schedule, I was actually building a schedule on the stream. Really? And and, uh, and I was telling people as I, as I was scheduling, like, oh, well, I know this person, you can't schedule them first thing in the morning because, you know, and I even said like, you know, and, and I, no, I did not mention names. I, I was like, in general, right? But I was like, oh yeah, you know, normally when I build a schedule, I'm like, well, I know person X, you know, they, they like to hang out at night until three or four in the morning. So we don't yeah. schedule them for that nine o'clock talk, right? Wow. <laughs> or you got the other folks who love to speak first thing in the morning. Yep. All right. Yep. Uh, uh, Joe uh, Joe Riley out of, out of Dayton is is sure he he tells you pick me for the first session in the morning. That's when I prefer to speak. Yeah. All right. He, I mean, easy done. That's always uh, first session of the day is always the hardest one to figure out who's who, hard one. Yeah, because no one wants to speak first in the first slot. Well, that's, I mean, that as I'm telling you, Chad, that's, that's a testament to your, your ability to listen and learn, right? You pay attention to people. That's a fantastic skill. That's, that's an amazing skill. Thank you. I appreciate it. I could not juggle. I could not deal with what you deal with it. To me, it's just an overload. It would just, it just drives me nuts just thinking about it. I'm involved in uh, a rest fest, which is this tiny event in September, in the fall, in the Carolinas. And it's maybe 50 people tops. It's a really small group. <laughs> and it stresses me to no end. And you're dealing with orders of magnitude. Right. Bigger than that. So that's that's fantastic. Plus, I, I think it helped that Copalooza was never really that small. I mean, we're, we're not a big conference by by any stretch of the map. You know, but, uh, uh, well, depending on who you talk to, we're not a big conference. Right. I was going to say, five, you have five or six hundred, anybody between 350 so, and 600 people, right? Well, so last year we had 840. 840? Yeah. I mean, that's not a big conference? Well, you know, when I go speak at conferences, you know, I have, you know, 2,000, 3,000 people. I'm like, ah, oh, you know. So it, it all depends who you talk to. But but the funny part about Copalooza, it, it was funny. When we first started, um, we were approached by one of the, one of the Microsoft uh, uh, evangelists, because they were still called evangelists back in those days. Yeah, and uh, and he was like, "Hey, you guys should do a a a day a day of .net in Louisville," and I'm like, "That sounds cool, right?" And he was like, "Yeah, do target like 50 people, you know, ones you know, just one session of, uh, of going on at a time, you know, in one day." I'm like, "Well, that sounds cool, but that, that why don't we do two days? Why don't we target 150 people and let's have like five people speaking at the same time, right?" And he looked at me like I was crazy, right? <laughs> and, uh, and and we did it, right? And we actually had, we had two hundred eighty nine. I to this day I remember exactly my attendance number, two hundred eighty nine the, the first hotel? day. What was the hotel that you did it in the it first a, year? It was a Sealback. It was a Sealback. That's yeah, right. Which, which is a, his, I was say, it's I a historic the hotel. First year was in that hotel, yeah. Which was uh, it, that's an awesome hotel. It's a it's it it's now a Hilton, which and Hilton has actually done really good with it. Uh, yeah. But it's it's a very historic hotel. Um, the the grand ballroom, which is where we had the uh, our keynote and our meals, yep. um, that was at, that room was actually the inspiration for the wedding scene in the Great Gatsby, because uh, really F. Scott Fitzgerald he actually spent a lot of time at the hotel. I did uh, not know that. So he was uh, when he was in the army, he was here in Louisville because uh, Louisville was one of the big boot well, Fort Knox was one of the big boot camps, and he yeah. actually because he already had some money, so he would spend a lot of time in the city. Huh. And, and he actually lived in a hotel for a while. And, and so, yeah. But, That's uh, amazing. I never knew that story. Boy, every, the next time I'm in the seal box, I'll think of that. Which is so sure enough for those who weren't at the first Co- uh, Copalooza. You know, so we're, we're having our keynote. And Cafe Press is, is one of our premier sponsors. And uh, they wanted to do T-shirt cannons. Well, the, the ceiling isn't that high <laughs> in that ballroom. <laughs> and they have these yeah. humongous big chandeliers. And they're shooting these things off, and I see all all the event staff looking like, "Oh my God, they're gonna cra- they're gonna kill all these chandeliers." Oh man, <laughs> I don't remember that, but yeah, but it wasn't long before that moved to the convention center, right? Uh, we moved to the convention center our fifth year. Oh, was and, the fifth year? Yeah, yeah, it was the fifth year because we, we were there, uh, so we were the back one year, and sure enough, we outgrew them the first year, which was yeah, that's that's an awesome feeling. 
Uh, yep. We moved to the Marriott for a couple of years, uh, yep. and then we were we were at uh, um, uh, Galt House for one year. Actually, I actually really liked the Galt House. Oh, that's right. But it was sort of out of the way, right? No, the Galt House was right there in downtown. It was the, the Galt House is actually the biggest hotel in, in, in Kentucky. Oh, what am I? Oh, that's right. What am I? Th- Never mind. Yeah, that was. Oh no! Of oh no! What, uh, so the year after we were at the convention center, we were all the way um, down to Shepherdsville, which that was out of the way. That's uh, right. And that was so the convention center actually they went through a renovation, that's and so right. they, they closed it down. And because of that, all the other venues became very expensive, and, yeah. and, and we just couldn't afford it. So we, you know, we we did that one year, and that that was a disaster. Uh, <laughs> it, it was a disaster, and it, it, we were just so far away from the city. Yep. And, then, and it uh, really crammed in again. You were you were oh, so yeah. much bigger than the venue allowed, right? Yeah, yeah. We 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 purposely lowered attendance. But we still hit, we we still oversold what we should have had what we should have sold. Uh, so then we moved to yeah out in the suburbs of of Louisville, which was nice. Um, the venue was was I mean it's you could tell it was an older venue. <laughs> yeah, just see this goes this just goes right to what I was talking about at the start of this thread. Like this just dealing with venues, just yeah. dealing with property and all that other stuff. That's so much. I well, mean, so I'm the so awesome part. So last yeah. last year we moved to to the Hyatt. And that was yeah. that was an awesome move, and they were great. Uh, they they were definitely the, uh, it's not the nicest space we've been in, but it was a really nice space. Uh, but the venue was just awesome. They really took care of us. Um, we were supposed to be there this year. Actually, we will still be there. Uh, so we're we're going to run a command center. Uh, really? So so me and basically about twelve to fifteen people total. Uh, we'll we'll run a command center, uh, and that way, if any issues happen, we're all there. Um, yeah. cause, so as a speaker, what you'll have, and I haven't been able to send out this link here cause I don't have them yet, but, uh, um, you'll actually, you'll have a link you'll go to, and then there will, there will be a proctor who will actually be watching your whole presentation. And that way, you know, uh, that way you don't have to worry about the chat cause they'll watch the chat. They'll, they'll, they'll see all that, but, uh, um, talking with the venue, you know, uh, which was one, they let me get out of the contract easier than most others. You know, I was talking to other, you know, other, you know, similar conferences, and they had yeah. so hard time getting out of their contracts because uh, the venues kept saying, "Well, we don't know that in June it's going to like KCDC." I, I know that for a fact they had these problems because you know, okay. they're at the conference center in Kansas City, and yeah. and and the, and the, the conference or the convention center was like, "Well, but we don't know." You know, this was in March. They're like, "Well, we don't know in June." That we're still going to be locked down. And, and, right. and of course, the organizers are like, "That's kind of obvious." <laughs> Yeah, like wow. <laughs> you know, and, and uh, um, so they they it took them a long time to be able to cancel their conference because they didn't know whether or not they were going to be able to get out of the contract. Um, yeah. Whereas me, I waited, um, but then when I, the moment I sent the email, they're like, "Yep, no, it, it, you're not going to be able to have us." Um, but then I talked to them I'm like, "Well, but let's have a yeah, let's still use one room, set it up, yep. you know." So so we're going to have social distancing, plenty of room, you know, because it's going to yep. be a big room that we're going to be in. Uh, yeah. And then we'll have an air wall up, and then uh, so one we'll basically have like a studio in there, uh, which, like I say, so I'm working on I'm working with the city to do some stuff because because the other part about Copalooza is showing off the city. Yes, and yeah. uh, uh, so we still want to do. And, and like I said, I'm working with the uh, with the travel bureau and stuff to you know how can we still show off the city virtually, right? Um, so I might, you know, I might have a real bourbon in my hand while, while you could virtually be enjoying us. You know, <laughs> I love it. Yeah, I love it. I mean, That's sure enough, the Hyatt actually has a really good bourbon bar. So uh, I've already been talking to them about doing something in the bourbon bar. You know, because no. uh, did you speak last year? I can't remember. No, last year okay. I was on the road somewhere else. I didn't get to do it last so, year. So you missed this venue. I mean, you know, so it's really nice bourbon bar right there. You know. Um, with outside seating, so it's it's really nice. So uh, so we'll we'll do something, you know, because sure enough, that's where it was great because we ended up not doing a speaker dinner, but it didn't matter because everyone just hung out at the bar anyways. Yeah, yeah. Louisville's a great town to to just hang out in. I love I love the downtown area. They've done a fantastic job. Mm-hmm. It's one of my favorite cities. Uh, I, no there's a reason why I live here. All right, and I, and, and, uh, and I, I moved away and I moved back. All right, and it's, oh, did you really? Yeah. Well, I mean, well, number one, I was in Marine Corps, so I definitely moved away for a while. Um, yeah. But uh, um, I actually lived in Miami for a while, and Miami was great, you know, except for I, I, I don't know Spanish, 
So it, it does not work very well. <laughs> really? Yeah. Even and, even through all your military, you didn't run into enough span pick up enough Spanish. Things. I I just never really picked up the language, and yeah. uh, and the interesting part was was I was having a hard time finding work because I didn't speak Spanish. And yeah. and, and again, me being my hothead self, I was like, <laughs> I don't need to talk to anybody. I just need to, you know. I'm, yeah. the code, <laughs> I remember telling a recruiter, I'm like, I write, but the code I write's in English, right? Because yeah. I was writing VB at the time. Like, it's, it's all in English. What, I don't need. And they were like, but you need to talk to your coworkers. I don't need to talk to my coworkers. I just <laughs> give, me, give me the requirements and I write the code. <laughs> Here, here's the code. Never right. mind. <laughs> so, um, so that was part of the reason why. Uh, well, plus, we really wanted to, uh, you know, we wanted to get back to the Midwest area. You know, of course, yeah. never can figure out what this little south is the Midwest. We, we, we have a identity crisis. We don't know where we're at. <laughs> Uh, you know what? We're here. We're right here. That's all I need to know. I, it's same here in Northern Kentucky. It's a little bit easier because you can sort of glom onto the Cincinnati. Yeah, space. You're, yeah, you're Northern Kentucky, but you're Cincinnati, right? It's, it's yeah, yeah. That's basically you know what I tell a lot of people. I'm from Cincinnati, and you know, and stuff like that. But I just love this particular area. I love the river area. Oh yeah. You know, in general, because we're you know because we're both Louisville and, and and Northern Kentucky are both on the same side of the river. Yeah. I love the river area. I love. Uh, being, you know, n- you know, near hiking and biking a couple of hours from the foothills of the mountains. You can go to the Red River Gorge you know, and, and back in a day. There's so much you can do here. Mm-hmm. So it's a fantastic area. I just love it. Yeah, I, 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 had, I moved here about 30 years ago from Michigan. I grew up in Michigan and Chicago and okay. all that. So I'm a sort of a northerner type. And I was a little bit skeptical of crossing this magical river point. <laughs> but boy, once I did, I never go back. Oh, yeah. You know, um... Yeah, you know, so so my father's family is all from Northern Kentucky, all right? Oh. So uh, uh, my dad graduated from Boone County, all right? So oh. it, yeah, so it's uh, yeah. so I, I I do spend. I mean, I I'm up there quite a bit uh, with you know uh, visiting family up there. Uh, no kidding. Although funny thing, talking about you know my father and everything. So I uh, so I went to Saint Xavier here in Louisville, uh, which is so for those who don't know Louisville and everything. So Saint Xavier is is the big. There's two really big boys Catholic high schools here in the city yeah. who yeah. have dominated high school football in the state forever, right? Yeah. And yeah. Uh, uh, so my freshman year of high school, uh, we won the, the state championship. And back in those days, it was Jefferson County, which is where Louisville's at, against the rest of the state. That, that was actually <laughs> the way how, how the championships were done. And uh, um, so sure enough, it was us versus Boone County. And my father, he, now my father was like, he already knew that, that you know, the San X was so good. He, and he, he was like, oh, well, y'all win the game. And he's like, but we got the band, right? Because he, he, <laughs> yeah. he was in the band, right? He, he's a musician, yeah. right? And I'm like, yeah, you do realize kids who don't play sports at San X are in the band, right? <laughs> <laughs> I was in the band. I, I was in band. I had a whole, I have a whole nother alter ego all through high school. In college, I was a I was a musician, and even after that, I was a full time musician for several years. Oh, really? Yeah, that's actually. I, if I'm not a, if I wasn't on the road for code, I'd be on the road for music. No, that's really. So good. I was, yeah, I was on the road all through the. So what the instruments 70s do you play? And 80s, yeah. What instruments do you play? Oh, um, I'm a reed man, tenor. So okay, mostly cool. tenor, tenor and alto, and then I started on clarinet, but I'm just I'm not good enough. It's too hard. So it's uh, tenor sax and alto sax, and I, I paid for my college that way, my oh, graduate cool. school, all through that. Did some uh, jingles and other stuff like that through the uh, through the, the early '80s, and then moved here, and then that's when I changed. Oh, that's really cool. So, uh, yeah. part, I'm, I'm the black sheep in my family. Um, so my my father is a percussionist. My mother was wow. music. Well, my mother was music theory, but or, uh, music theater, but she stopped doing that w- way young. Uh, my brother is okay. actually a, a pretty big uh, DJ in Chicago, um, and he got me right. <laughs> yeah, because <laughs> I have so you no. Were, you were I always have, like a, I like have a no coach. musical talent whatsoever. You know, it's <laughs> but it skips a generation or something. What, well, so, so sure enough, my daughter, like I said, she's she's in grad school right now. She's actually studying uh, musical performance. So she, she's really? a, what yeah, is her instrument? Vocal. Wow. So she's she's yeah. trying to become an opera singer. Fantastic. And and that's another tough life. Oh yeah. Yeah. It's that's a that's a tough business. And trust me, especially now the fun part, you know, going back to life in the pandemic, the fun part is I'm the referee between my twenty three year old daughter and my wife, right? <laughs> <laughs> 
Because <laughs> my wife's looking like, oh, she's just wasting her, you know, what, what is she doing? She can't afford anything. I'm like, it's okay. It'll be all right. That's exactly right. It'll you be know, fine. You know, It'll cause, be Because I definitely have the philosophy of, you know, you got to do what you're happy with, right? Because you know, exactly. if you're not happy, you're, you're just miserable, right? And it's, yeah. And, and you, you know. Got, you got to take it as it comes, too. That's the other thing that I think we're all kind of relearning again, right? Whatever's coming at you, you got you got to grab hold of it and and deal mm-hmm. with it. You can't uh, you can't just uh, be passive and you, you can't think that you can control everything. You take it as it comes and do what you want to do. Oh yeah. So yeah. sure. So so it's interesting. One of the things I was going to ask you about. So, so you, you were a musician and then you moved into uh, into code. Which yeah. number one? There, there's a lot of studies that say there's there's a tie between music and, and, and code. But so yeah. I mean, how how did you get started in technology? Yeah, so it was actually it was a little bit circuitous route. So uh, I was actually uh, living in Lyme, Ohio, uh, and I was on the road quite a bit. I would actually go to a staging point. Sometimes I'd, uh, the main drop-off point was uh, Indianapolis, stuff like this. But I would travel a lot. And when I wasn't traveling, I got kind of tired of traveling on the road quite a bit. I got involved in a visual arts organization. So I'd been a music major. I'd done my graduate degree in writing uh, you know, stuff, music theory, and I wrote a string orchestra piece. So and so and so. Um, so I got involved in an artist group, a visual artist group. And there happened to be a computer there sitting on the desk that nobody used. It was an Apple IIe, I think. And I started programming. I started just like playing around with that. And I said, oh, this is kind of interesting. And then uh, even more sort of uh, you know adjacent, my wife's brother got for Christmas a Texas Instrument computer. So this was what? in the early 80s, 80, 79, 70, 80, something like that, something like that. And I took to it immediately. And of course, the first thing I did with it is I used it to program music. <laughs> I got it to play songs because mm-hmm. I knew I knew music. So that was sort of my bridge. And then I was hooked. I just loved computing. And I just kept doing more and more of that over time. So um, once I started doing that, that was early in the, in the days of microcomputers. If you had an IBM office computer or a K-Pro or you know, anything like that or an Apple, and some, you knew how to program it, you were unique in the, in the office. So I started picking up more and more of that. And my brain, the, the part of me that thinks about music structure and thinks about melody and harmony and coordination fits perfectly with the notion of thinking about software structure and clients and servers and services and all these other things. So I do use the same kind of brain. In fact, going even more, you know, nerdy on it, uh, I did a lot of improvisation uh, uh, playing. I did a lot of jazz Mm -hmm. and stuff like that, pop music and jazz, where you basically have a structure and you just, you know, do what you want. Well, that's the way I write programs on the web. So I'm sort of, you know, my brand is kind of the RAS hypermedia person. And that's the way that works. You actually create a place where clients can do whatever they want. You don't tell them what to do. So there's even more philosophical or sort of, you know, eth, you know, sure. I don't know how you explain it, ways of thinking about this, stylistic ways of thinking about it. The way I think of code is influenced by music. Oh, I, I definitely say, I, I, I actually, you know, over the last couple of years, I've been getting more and more interested in music theory because um, my, my daughter struggles with music theory. Uh, yeah. She, she's like, I just want to sing, right? You know? Yeah, right. <laughs> and uh, um, but uh, when I look at it, I, I you know, it, it, which is why I always tell everyone, music theory is basically the math of music, all right? Yeah. And when you there's, really there's an old there's an old joke with musicians, and like you would meet up with a musician on stage, and they would play together, people who'd never met, right? Uh, and somebody would say, "Can you read music?" And the answer would be, "Yeah, but not enough to hurt my playing." <laughs> And that's kind of the relationship of theory to performance, right? right? It's like, you know, theory, yeah, but not enough to mess up my singing, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. But sure not, I mean, going back to my daughter, that's her whole thing. She's uh, she's more an aural listener. And so, yeah. uh, 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 which is, so her current uh, uh, voice coach is a male. And it's her first time having a male voice coach. And, and when she started, she's like, I don't know how this is going to work. She's like, <laughs> I'm used to working with sopranos because she's a soprano, right? She's like, I'm used to working with sopranos. Who I hear them, and then I can go yeah. off. I can go off of that. Yeah. And she's like, but now you know, she's like, well, one's a guy, and then the two, he's definitely not soprano. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but, but I'm, I'm, it has I'm actually sure. worked really well for her. She's actually learned yeah. a lot because of that, right? And, yep, exactly. Um, actually, for her, it's it's forced her to understand the music better, and I think also have her own voice, right? So she's yeah. no longer just 
imitating. Well, she's never, she's she was never imitating, right? All, the good part of her, she was listening, she was listening to how the voice was being sung, which is, which is what you're supposed to do, right? Is, yep. you know, but, so she was never actually imitating. Cool. Uh, um, well, early on, because I mean, that's how she learned, she originally, I mean, when she, she started singing, I mean, well, she started lessons when she was like six. Um, no. and, and it's because we heard her in that, you know, we hear her just yeah. singing, you know, because my wife would listen to a lot of like, you know, uh, Celine Dion and Mars Filipino. Yeah. So she listened to a lot of uh, Filipino singers. They're very similar to like Celine Dion, Dion style. And my yeah. daughter would just, you know, driving the car, she'd just start singing it, right? And, and that's when we could, we could tell, okay, oh, she's got something to that voice. You got a thing here. And, and uh, uh, but like I say, up until, up until, uh, you know, the beginning of her first year of masters, she, always had female singer uh you know singers or uh teachers yeah uh to include she's had an opera singer you know once as well she, obviously her whole collegiate has been opera singers but uh even sure. early on she had an opera singer which was, was really neat uh, also she learned how to be a diva from the opera singer <laughs> <laughs> Which you have to deal with the backlash. yeah i mean because this was i mean this was a woman who you know she show up at the at the, at the school uh music school scarves on she's like oh well it's you know it's 60 degrees outside i gotta warn you know keep my voice warm and i'm like oh, okay exactly right. <laughs> you're coming here for a voice lesson but all right you know with an eight-year-old i'm like okay <laughs> that's right <laughs> absolutely yeah but uh no I mean, I, it's interesting i'm very interested in music i just have no talent right I, it's uh, uh but i do i i definitely see a lot of of you know of traceability between music and, and sure code. oh yeah it's it, so yeah this goes back to what you had said earlier there are definitely um a, a lot of things that i've read and and other people i've talked to you know anecdotal stories where um there are a lot of uh m there's a lot of uh you know intersectionality between music mm -hmm. and computing alan Kay, the guy who really gave it gave us object-oriented programming and so many early things he was actually a full-time musician who started working uh, uh, on computing in the in the seventies, and he wasn't really sure what he wanted to do. Right? He, it was it was sort of something like that. And there are more and more characters like that. There are even stranger things. Um, um, uh, I forget who the guy was who gave us encryption. Uh, I can't. Uh, uh, Claude Shannon. Yeah. Claude Shannon, who actually thought of the parody bit and all these other things, worked for Bell in the in the forties, thirties, forties, and fifties. He was an avid juggler. Right. He, he he worked at all these sort of computing theories, but he loved juggling. He was actually working on creating a juggling robot in the 1960s. So there are all sorts of weird things that about the way the brain works and talents and skills that are very sort of creative that really bleed into the computing space. So I I usually just assume if I'm talking to a, a computer uh, person that they have they have some sort of creative talent uh, that they also pursue whether it's singing or playing mm -hmm. or writing or artwork or or woodwork one of my one of my editors is a fantastic cabinetry maker uh it's just amazing so i, I always see that i always see mm -hmm. that and maybe that's everybody maybe you know this is just a lens but i always see some kind of creative thing going on oh, yeah. so sure i mean what do you like doing outside of work oh actually uh, one of the things I really enjoy doing outside of work is actually working in the yard. <laughs> um, I don't have a fantastic lawn. I don't have a big property, but um, working in the grass. I used to teach a I used to teach a class in uh, organic gardening oh, wow. and uh, organic lawn care. I've got a compost pile in the house, you know, in the back. So I like being outside. That's a sort of a a, a real tangible thing for me, uh, and that's actually one of the reasons I really enjoyed being home. Yeah. these last couple of months because I can spend more time in the yard. I start the day with some kind of yard work or something like that. And it makes me feel good the rest of the day. I used to earn money uh, in high school in the summers as a groundskeeper. So that's my tangible. That's my connector. So I love doing stuff like that. Cool. So, um, yeah. wait, so what, what's been your, uh, so what's your biggest achievement this year on your, on your yard? <laughs> well, we have, we have a super challenge going on. So, um, after years and years of, of trouble and leaks, we finally got uh, the basement sort of, you know, treated for, for it's been dug up and, and we got a sump pump and all these other things in order to dry the base, keep the basement dry all through the season. Um, well, that tears up the whole yard. So now I've got this huge section of yard that I have to nurse back to health. 
So I've spent the last uh, spent the last six weeks or so get, getting grass back in and kind of getting it all looking normal. And then we had some other kind of problem, which meant they had to tear up the yard again. <sighs> so now I'm back to square one. So my big accomplishment this year is very mundane, and that is to actually make it look like nothing has been torn up over right. the last six months. And that's going to take me all season probably. <laughs> I know the feel. So we haven't had anything torn up. But uh, last year was horrible in our yard. We we it just dry. I mean, it, we had a drought and it just yeah. dried out our yard so bad. And, um, it, it, we had a bunch of a bunch of our yards sunk in a little bit last year. So we're my wife and I have been working on on getting that. You know, yeah. Uh, uh, which also it's my wife allowing her to to complain about how no one else takes care of their yard. <laughs> now, see, I got to tell you also. My, my wife is a gardener, like a flower gardener. Mm. She's got an amazing flower garden. She grows some herbs and some tomatoes as well, which are fantastic. But she's done this year after year. So a lot of times I help her. And the other thing she does is we've got wildlife in our yard. Even though we have a small suburban yard, we have a kind of a, a wild uh, hill in the back. Mm -hmm. You know, in northern Kentucky, everybody's got a hill. But um, so we've got rabbits and squirrels and chipmunks and all sorts of birds. And she's been feeding them year after year. We go outside, sit on the porch and we watch bunnies like hot. Oh, yeah. I mean, they were really, really so lucky. And it's because of her effort for all these years of really maintaining a great uh, flower garden, hummingbirds and all sorts of things. So it's, it's, a, it, we're very, very lucky. And again, you know, I used to, for the last 10 years, I kind of missed a lot of this. I would spend a weekend and that would be it. I'd mow the lawn, you know, edge, you know, do some work. Now, every day I get to sit on the porch if I want to and, and look at things. So I'm very lucky. So I'm curious, uh, when we can start traveling again, are you going to be traveling like you were before? Are you going to try to do a little bit different? You know, I think I, right now, I think I'm going to do it a little bit different um, for lots of reasons. You know what? I'm an old man. <laughs> I should really have been slowing down anyway. Um, but I have really been enjoying this connection. I've actually spent more time face to face, like talking mm -hmm. like you and I are talking, like when would you and I have a chance to talk for over an hour? Right. Like, you know, I, I've never, I've never done that in, in 10 years. So in a lot of ways, I've been enjoying this more. Um, it gives me a little bit more control over my schedule. It's weird. I, I don't know for sure. Uh, but I think I'm, I think I'm just def definitely going to be doing it less. This may have just been an inflection point for yeah. me that I'll just start to cut back a little bit. Um, it's hard for me sometimes to change habit. So a little a little disruption is really the best way sometimes for me to start new habits. That's interesting. I mean, talking to folks who who travel a lot, if some are like, "Oh my God, I can't wait till I can travel again. I, I need to get out of the house." Others are more yeah. like you. It's like, "Oh, you know, maybe I should probably take a little bit easier." You know, it's yeah. you know, uh, we were talking before. You know, the the, the uh, uh, now I forget the name of the Clooney movie. Um, Oh, up in the air. Up in the air, right? And yeah. uh, you know, he, he spends 46 weeks out of the year, so that means six weeks of the, of the year he's miserable in his house, right? You know, it's Miserable in his house, exactly right. Why, why would I do that? Right. <laughs> yeah, it's exactly right. And, and, and I know people who are like that, right? Who, who just absolutely love traveling, uh, you know, never want to really be home. Uh, yeah. Of course, for me, I've, I mean, I've always told I like, people, I don't ask me about that, like, do you like to travel? Do you, like, you're gone so often and so on and so forth? Because, you know, I'm super lucky. I could travel in, in Asia and Europe and, mm -hmm. and Eastern Europe and South America. I'm just an amazingly lucky person. And I always tell them the same thing. I like being there, but not getting there. Right. I don't like the, the, the planes and the waiting and the luggage and the rental cars and all that. See, the funny but part, I, love I, I actually enjoy that. In a new spot. Huh? I'm, I'm probably a little weird. I actually like the travel part. No, I don't know why, no. you know, number one, because I don't let it get to me. All right. I actually got, I'm a people watcher, right? Which we yeah, were talking about, right? I'm true. a people watcher. And so yeah. I love being at the airport and watching people getting frustrated, right? <laughs> because, because that's yeah. such a light. You realize it's not that big of a deal, right? <laughs> yeah. So Which, you're, you're definitely right. It took me, it took me a while, a, a couple of years. Well, I was frustrated. It should be like this. It's like, relax, man. It is what it is. <laughs> And I would tell my family sometimes early on in a day, and you know, like a, a stormy day, a weather day, whatever, said, I know this is going to take a long time. And about once, maybe twice a year, I would be derailed. I would have to spend an extra night yeah. somewhere or I'd miss a flight or I'd have to once maybe a year I'd have to cancel an event or reschedule a limit. And you get you get used to it after a while. Right. So you're smart in that sense. And I'm kind of like you. 
um, I'll sit there with my coffee or whatever and just kind of watch <laughs> people go by. And my wife would and I would have this thing where we would see other people, other families, and we would tell the story. Like, right. oh, they're married and they're so-and-so and they're going off to a this. And like we would sort of entertain ourselves that way. Well, so see, you do get used to it. Well, but see, it's funny me, things. I actually don't like traveling with my wife because she's an exactly. anxious. I don't actually like traveling with my wife because she's an anxious traveler. Oh. Right. So, so any little things like, oh, oh. Or, you know, what's going to happen? What's going to happen? You know, I'm like, oh, it's no big deal. It'll be all right. You know, like, I mean, two years ago, we went over to uh, to uh, London and Paris and yeah. uh, we got delayed because the storm's coming through. Actually, Atlanta got closed down. Sure. Uh, and and, uh, um, and so we were, you know, we missed our, our connecting flights. And well, we never even got out of Louisville because uh, we, we were, they kept on, you know, yeah, you know, the flight before us was still sitting there. The plane yeah. that we were on was still in Atlanta. Uh, yeah. um, and it, it, it sure enough, Delta did good. Uh, Grant you, I mean, I travel enough that, you know, I have status with them, right? But, uh, which helps, it helps when you go to the desk. And I'm nice about it, right? Because yeah. I even told him, like, uh, so I, my first question, I'm just curious, any possibility we can get on this flight this way? And he's like, no, we're fully booked. And I'm like, well, obviously we're not gonna make our flight to, to London. And then, uh, uh, and I told him, I said, look, just get me in Atlanta. I'm cool with that. And we'll, yeah, we'll, we'll get a hotel tonight. And, and he, it was good. He actually looked, he's like, well, I'll tell you what, I can actually, uh, uh, it's like, I can get you on American and then fly to Chicago tonight. And then first thing tomorrow morning, you fly to London. And basically we'll get there like six hours later than we were supposed to get there. I'm like, cool. Yeah. Uh, the only problem was the next day in Chicago, they had storms going through. And so we were, you know, yeah. So this whole yeah. time, my wife's all, you know, I mean, at one point she's like, I'm just going home. Let's forget about it. <laughs> like, no, no, Thank it'll be it. all right. You know, yeah. and, then, and then the funny part was once we got to London, they had no idea where our luggage was. And, and uh, which I'm like, yeah, no big deal. Let's go buy a t-shirt and I'll, I'll be good, right? You know? uh, and the funny part was, is, you know, going back to my daughter, my daughter was going over for the summer, right? To, to be a part of a, an opera institute. Sure. And so I actually was more worried about her luggage because she had all her dresses and you know for, for performances and stuff. Yeah, I, I was like, I don't, I really care less about my clothes, right? I care about her. Of course, my you know my wife's here, and it's like, no, you care about our clothes too. I'm like, ah, not really. <laughs> I once spent a, spent a, a ten day holiday in Italy. They lost my luggage completely. Not my wife's, just mine. <laughs> lost my luggage in Manchester. I spent the whole ten days living out of a a, a shopping bag with clothes that I would buy along the way. That's right. like, that's all I could do. So what are you going to do? You just yeah, do actually kind of sounds kind of fun, you know, just, you know, don't have simple. to worry about it, right? It's simple, exactly. It's simple. Here we I, by, the, by the end of the 10 days, I might've looked a little bit like a homeless person, but you know, <laughs> it was easy. Here, we got a good question on, on the chat. So oh, cool. uh, uh, completely different. But uh, so what's the hardest thing about uh, learning or teaching API design? Oh, that's a really good one. So, um, I would say the hardest thing about API design is that it's it's not engineering, right? So many of us work uh, as engineers. We know code, we know process, we know pattern, we know we know math, we know measure. But design is really actually doing what you were talking about earlier, Chad, which is really paying attention to people. Um, so that I think is, is can be a really challenge. It was a super challenge for me. Um, because what you really need to do is you need to ask people what's their problem and how, how can we solve it? And then you experiment and you sort of test things out and you show them things. And then finally they say, yeah, 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 that's it. Because there's always hidden assumptions, extra data, things they hadn't thought of. And it isn't until you ask them. Mm -hmm. So it's that ability that you, that you sort of build up over time. But then you still need process and engineering to turn that, that, that sort of ethnography, that research into working code that's consistent. So it's really this combination of two things. So when I wrote the, the new book, Design and Build Great Web APIs, there's a whole, there's one third of it is design, one third of it is build, and one third of it is release. And I really spent a lot of time on the design side for that reason. So I think um, that, that notion that what you really have to start from is asking a lot of questions from somebody else in order to, to figure out what you need to do, uh, that has been a real challenge. And uh, designing training materials that sort of encourage that is also a challenge, especially if you're like working like in a book on your own. Like, how do you do that? So that's sort of an extra effort. But for me, I think that's the thing, knowing that you're you need to pay attention to others. 
what's their problem and how can you help them solve it? That once you get past that hump, I think the rest of it's pretty good. Mm -hmm. Well, I can imagine how difficult it is to teach a bunch of engineers to don't be an engineer. <laughs> well, but it, but the thing is, at the same time, engineers, people who spend their whole life engineering, they know measure, they know paying attention to, to, mm -hmm. to important information. They know what's statistically significant. They know that there's a pattern and a process and resilience. They know all these things. It's merely just sort of a redirecting of all of that great skill and talent into this one sort of uh, this act of asking and collecting and reflecting. So once you get to that, I think it's really it's it's really not bad. One of the things I talk about early on is one of the things you can do, especially if you're a good uh, engineer, if a good developer, a good programmer, is you learn these things about what are the measurable changes. We need to we need to create an API that that get that makes it easier to onboard a customer, that makes it harder to make a mistake, that makes it you know faster to process outstanding you know claims or whatever. That's a measurable item. Like so, you measure how fast is it you know is it going now. What effort does it take now? Which things can we change? So you need that engineering. And actually, you need to teach designers that. I also have people who come from a design perspective, more of that creative stuff that we were talking about earlier. Mm -hmm. And you have to help them figure out that, yeah, 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 it's design is great. But there's a point at which you have to stop and you say, we're here to make this engineering process better, faster, easier, safer, more resilient, more secure. You got to have a measure. So you got to teach it both ways. And I've, I've worked on both sides of that. So sure, you know, bring back up the, the book. So yeah. um, is the book uh, technology agnostic or is it uh, particular to a, a stack? It's, yeah, it's actually, it, it's, it's sort of told in a technology agnostic way. There's, there's a skill in every chapter that, the the sort of the idea of the modeling chapter about how you model a process and the designing chapter about a design process that you can use to build the API and the description of the API and then the sketching and the prototyping and the building and the testing and the securing and the deploying. That's all generic. So there's sort of a, a lesson that you can carry no matter what language or what platform you're working in. At the same time, there are exercises throughout the book and all the all the code and exercises in the book are written in Node. Okay. And I had to decide early on, uh, you know, what to pick. Originally, uh, the course was actually done in C Sharp because I started with C Sharp in like the earliest days. Mm -hmm. um, but I need, I needed, I wanted to come up with something that was close enough that everybody could sort of read it, whether you're writing C Sharp or Java or VB or even, even you know, PHP or something like that or Ruby. This looks, you know, similar. It's a little bit, a little bit more challenging if you're doing something like Rust or Go or something like that. But mm -hmm. so it's Node and NPM as the implementation detail. But then every single chapter talks about things in a relatively generic way, so that even if you're, you know, if you're working in Visual Studio, you can still apply each of the lessons right. in each of the stories. Yeah. No, I think that makes a lot of sense because, uh, uh, yeah, Node's a little bit more generic when it comes to to that, as opposed to, like, I mean, C Sharp. Obviously, they're, they're you know. Well, my biggest complaint about Microsoft over the last couple of years is that they, you know, they have not been authoritative enough, right? That like, well, here, here's 20 different ways to do the thing. I'm like, well, tell me the right way to do the thing, right? Um, yeah. But at the same rate, there's still you, you're definitely you're locked in a couple of different ways of doing it, right? Whereas Node, it's just a standard way. So, I, you know, same thing with Java, right? If you did it with Java, it'd be, well, you want you, you want to use these frameworks, this, you know, yeah. Um, yep. It's obviously C sharp. The first well, it's probably gonna be Web API, which um, yeah. Of course, actually, I've been I've been going away from Web API. Uh, really? What What have you been using as have you, as a I've replacement? Using, Are you just sort of going back to? I've been doing more of Azure, Azure Functions. Have, Azure Functions. What's that? Azure Functions. Oh, sure. Okay. Which, now, really, which is interesting. It adds more whole more management to, to your yeah. yeah because now you're managing all these different points. Um, but what it allows me to do is. I can allow the different ones scale independent of each other, and I don't have to worry about it. All right. Yeah, I did a I did a report for O'Reilly. Uh, it was released in January on just serverless in general, mm -hmm. and I talked about the Azure platform, the Google platform, and the Amazon platform. And one of the things I talked about is really this idea that we're sort of shifting focus. Um, when you're doing something like Azure Functions, you're really sort of like taking your mind away from things like. HTTP and scaling and gateways and all of because somebody else is going to handle that. Mm -hmm. one, of the, one of the things that I always learned from Microsoft early on 
is we want to get the plumbing out of the way so you can focus on what's important. And Azure Functions is a great example of that. So I see a lot of that going on. There was actually a time, I, I, this book took me a long time, it took me more than a year, which is really atypical for me. But I was thinking about actually making this book about serverless, mm -hmm. but I didn't. And I'm kind of glad I didn't for other reasons. But there definitely needs to be more of that, more of sort of best practice and pattern that goes across the platforms. Because I find more and more people like you talking about the idea of just picking up Azure Functions or, 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 or you know, the Google equivalent or something like yeah. that. Yeah. yeah, I mean, so you like it. You like this. You like this sort of feel to it because it there is more setup. There's more fiddly bits in the beginning. Well, there's definitely there's a whole lot more setup, and it's definitely more a lot more management, right? But yeah. um, it's kind of doing microservices while not doing microservices, right? I mean, oh I yeah, mean, yeah, yeah. I think it, I, actually, I think it takes a lot of the the positive the positive aspects of microservices, mm -hmm. which is this decoupling, this ability to scale easy the ability to redeploy all that. That's one of the reasons we like that microservice thing, right? I think the challenges are you got to figure out regions and security well, contexts. You, you, and and, and you, know, you have to be, uh, got to be strict with it, right? So the, yeah. the problem with Azure Functions is I can very easily build a monolith in an Azure Function, right? Um, <laughs> but then you, you know, you're really, one, you're going to really screw yourself over by doing that. But yeah. uh, so I, you know, I, I talk a lot about and make sure that these these functions only have the bare minimum that they have to have, right? Yeah. And then when they need something else, that's another function, right? Another function. And, yeah. and and what prime example, right? So uh, so where I'm at right now, we we have a big monolith that we're we're in the middle of breaking apart, and yeah. uh, well, we're trying to break apart. It's been kind of slow, but uh, we're we're having a problem. So so it's a learning platform, right? So for medical okay. students, and you can write notes, yep. right? And and uh, the problem we have our notes is you can also you can embed images into your notes, and, and okay. you know and and honestly most of the students actually do not embed. We have a lot of notes. Very few notes have images in them, right? Okay. Uh, but it is definitely a feature. And then we have some who end up putting a lot of really big images in there, right? Now okay. there's also the problem that we're currently, and this is going to be fixed uh, very soon, but currently. Those images are saved in binary in the database, which is a problem. Yeah. And yeah. so our, we're getting CPU spikes every once in sure. a while because basically sure. all of a sudden the CPU is having to re reconstitute these images. And uh, so about three months ago, well, all of a sudden we were starting to see CPU spikes for about a two hour period every night. And we traced it down to one user. <laughs> but it was what was great about it, I was like, this is why I'm telling you we need to use Azure Functions, right? Because yep. Because if I had an Azure function, it would just be that function that yep. was having a spike instead of the whole API. Yep. Because that was the whole problem. I mean, this one user was bringing down a whole, well, he wasn't bringing it down, it was just slowing it down. Sure. But, you know, but it was slowing it down. <laughs> and it was, you know, it was setting off my, you know, my, my well, not my pager, because it was only pagers, but, uh, you know, my quote unquote pager. The alerts, it was pa yeah, exactly. Yeah. Pa pager duty was, was firing off. Hey, you got a problem. Hey, you got a problem. And I'm like, oh, what now, right? And it's the same problem. So that, that's one of the reasons why I really like doing it that way, which again, microservices themselves, you, which you do in web API can do that also. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. I so, just like I the mean, fact I don't have to think about it. Right. Right. Exactly. I, that's what I'm going to say. I'm just hearing more and more people saying, look, I, I, I need that other stuff to be commoditized. You know, remember early in the going, you know, you had to decide if you were going to be on the windows platform or the Mac platform. And then we got rid of that. And then you had to decide if you were going to like, if you were going to have your own hardware or if you were going to virtualize, you know, mm -hmm. the hardware and, you know, dockers and containers. And then we got rid of that. We keep sort of moving further and further up the stack. So now to the point where we're actually making these, these functions, so many other things that we don't have to worry about anymore. You just write these short functions to handle a particular problem. You let all the other traffic, you got orchestration and other things, but I think we just keep moving the bar somewhere. And I think that's a positive in all, in all the cases. Yeah. Now, with it being yeah. said, though, and, and you know, because I've now been presenting about serverless for three years, I guess. And, yeah. and the one thing, the biggest thing I've learned is that it's so simple that you can quickly get in danger, right? You know, because yeah, you know, because uh, there are a lot. You know, talk about the organization, right? You really need to think about that. You really need to think about keeping it small, keeping it, you know, make sure it only does exactly what it needs to do. Yeah, you know. Um, yeah, one thing that's, that's a classic problem, right? Yeah, you know, I always have to remind people don't put don't, people, people can can make mistakes easier. Yeah, 
Because I always tell people, make sure your libraries are as small as possible. Because yep. that affects how the performance of, of that Azure function. Or, yes. And really, it's the same way, whether it's AWS Lambdas or, or, or uh, yep. GCP functions. It's all the same yep. thing. But uh, yep. you know, that, that package makes a difference. Um, yep. And usually when I talk to people who are like, well, we tried it, but it was so expensive. And I go, you know, then I go look at their stuff because they have these really big packages. And so every time their function is running, you know, they're loading like eight megs of packages. I'm like, well, guess what? Yeah. <laughs> you're, you're paying for that space every time you're running that, right? That's, yep. that's the way how functions yep. work. But, uh, yeah. And, and when you get it down to the transaction, that's the other advantage of this, uh, of this serverless platform too, is that you actually, you actually get the receipts, you know, you get mm -hmm. the details. Yeah. It, that package right there is like loading a million times. What are you doing there? You've got way too much code here. You don't need all this. And you really get to find out what's going on, whereas it's harder sometimes in a very large uh, code base, a large monolith, to figure out where your hotspots are. It's mm -hmm. much easier in, in a serverless environment. Well, your last question I've got for you, and this is yeah. so that, and the completely switching topics now, but, uh, you know, uh, so what is your advice to people who are, who are new in the industry trying to, to figure out what they're doing? Like, like just... Computing in general, yeah. or APIs, or uh, you can you can tailor more to APIs yeah. since that's your you know that's your thing. But... I'll start I'll start with the API space. I I think what what I tell people um and, and some of this comes out in the book. I've got some early you know getting started section in the mm -hmm. book is you're really what you're trying to do is solve a business problem. You're trying to solve a problem some company or some team or some person has. So be a problem solver. Uh, and and uh, if you want to get started. Figure out, you know, what problems are interesting to you. You know, are you interested uh, in, uh, you know, engineering problems? Are you interested in design problems? Are you interested in medical problems? Are you interested in, you know, geological problems? What what stuff sort of sparks your your interest right now? Don't worry that it may not last a long time, or you may change your mind, or something like that. This kind of goes uh, to what we were talking about careers earlier. But find something that sort of sparks your your interest now and dig in. And then the, the second thing is once you sort of pick something, the other thing I tell people is ask lots of questions. Tell everyone you're new at this, even if you've been at it for a decade or more. <laughs> tell everyone you're new at this and tell them you want to ask questions. And then learn. Take notes. Don't ask the same question over and over. But, you know, right. ask a lot of questions because there are super smart people around all the time that are willing to tell you what they've learned. A lot of the stuff that's in this book it reflects all of the years I've been teaching this stuff, and it's what I've learned from students. When I would teach something and they would say, yeah, I don't really get it, or, you know, it would be a lot easier with this, or I learned how to do this. So find something that sparks you to get started. Ask lots and lots of questions. Always play the newbie. Always play the learner in the room. And then uh, do lots of experiments. Don't, don't be afraid to fail. Don't be afraid to make a mistake. Don't be afraid to build something that doesn't work. Be afraid of drilling a hole in the bottom of the boat. You know, don't bet your your mortgage on one idea, but do lots and lots of little experiments. Hey, what if I change this code a little bit? What if I what if I did this in Azure as an Azure function rather than as a standalone bit of code? So just constantly experiment. And when you think about it, you really think about this idea of of finding something something that you're passionate about. Something uh, act as always be the learner in the room, always be the, the one that's willing to ask a question and always be willing to, to take a chance on a small experiment. That's really a fantastic way of approaching anything. And so I just encourage people, you know, whether you want to start as designer, as an engineer, as a deployment expert, as a as a team leader, whatever, if you can do those things, passion, learner and experiment, I think you get a lot out of everything. And then you can constantly change. You can, you know, if the winds change, if it's suddenly you're not traveling and you're staying at home, I've got lots here to learn about. I've got lots of things that I need to ask lots of questions about, mm -hmm. and I still get to have a good time. No, that's awesome. You know, uh, right, so so my boss, uh, you know, he, he always gives the advice of just build things. Just right? build things. Yeah, you know, it doesn't right? matter what it is, just build things, right? And, and, and I've always really liked that advice, right? And, that's, oh. that's really good advice. That's a much simpler version, right? Just build yeah, yeah. it. Just well, he, build it. He, he likes putting things very simply. But yeah, it's a... Uh, but, that's right. but I mean, no, I, I really like that that, uh, that answer. That was a really good answer. Awesome. I, Mike, I really appreciate you, you coming on and joining me here. It's been a lot of fun. 
I've had uh, a great time, man. It's been know, fantastic. And I'm looking forward to seeing you, right, <laughs> at, at Code Palooza, talking about Postman and all those other things and all the other stuff you got going on. Again, I'm very excited because I'll get – it'll take me weeks to get through all the material uh, from the event because you yep. got so much going on. But I really appreciate it. Oh, I appreciate that. It's great. Yep. So, And then for everyone else, so sure enough, uh, tomorrow we'll, we'll be back on our normal uh, – you know, we'll, uh, actually, we might be doing something a little bit different. We might not be working the ORM tomorrow. Um, I got a couple of little projects. So sure enough, yeah, Mike, I've been building a, a, a Gremlin database ORM, which is really, which has been kind of interesting. Yes. So I, I've been fascinated with graph databases for the last couple of years. Yeah. But writing applications against them are really hard because you got to write yeah. all these long strings. You're concatenating all that. So I, I, I started. I just one day said, hey, "Let's build an ORM." <laughs> Wow. So it's been a. So uh, is this is this like sort of like autumn? Is there generic mutators and resolvers, or what are you what are you doing here? So yeah, I'm basically you know, you, uh, you define your end. So I'm I'm, I'm mimicking somewhere what uh, any framework has done, but I'm not going to, nearly to the level of detail they're going into. Sure. But, so you have your your classes that represent your vertexes, and then yes. uh, and then I'm basically I'm looking I'm I'm reflecting over that and I'm getting the properties out of that and building the the gremlin wow. strings. Reflection. I'm going to have to tune in. This yeah. is very interesting. <laughs> it's, it's been a lot of fun. And, and it's, the interesting part about doing all the stuff online, you know, live with everyone, is everyone gets to see. I could, yeah. I've twice now have completely changed the path of where this was going. Yeah. Right? See, you're doing first, just what I think. Yeah, because you know, at first I was do, like, oh, right? let me just do something real simple. And I'm like, well, that's too simple. Then I went down this one path. I'm like, oh, the moment, I don't know how much you know about graph database, but you know, graph, you have your vertexes, which represent your, your objects. You have your edges, which represent the yeah. relationships between those objects. Yeah. Once I started to get to the point, okay, now I need to, to build a, uh, an edge. I'm like, oh, this isn't going to work, and I'm gonna have to redo. I'm gonna have to redo all this again. Wow. But uh, but cool. like I said, I, I might be doing a little bit different tomorrow. I uh, was actually I've been looking at how we're gonna do Copalooza, and now Foundation is doing something very interesting. Um, how the, so they're they're now doing uh, virtual user groups. And you, so you can, if you're a .NET Foundation group, which, you know, so like my group is, you can actually, you know, they'll host you on their YouTube channel. Uh, but what was really interesting, I uh, was hearing how they set this up. They actually have uh, Azure VMs that are running the OBS for you. And which solves a big problem I have, right? Because I'm trying yeah. to, figure out, you know, like I said, we're gonna have this command center, we're gonna have everyone together. And I've been trying to, okay, am I going to buy machines, which we don't have the money to buy machines, right. you know, but, you know, because of an MVP, I get credit from, from Azure. I'm like, hey, I can, I can run these VMs. So That's amazing. So we were talking earlier, I use a system called WeVideo, which mm -hmm. is kind of OBS-like, but it's a service. Right. So I don't have to run it locally. It's not as, it's not as detailed as OBS. I don't have all the controls you do. But it's for the same kind of reason. So that's, yeah. to see a hosted OBS is very interesting. So, yeah, so I'm a... Uh, so sure enough, I uh, so it's John Galway who uh, you know, was uh, talking about this. I, I emailed him. He sent me all the details of what they're working on. I, I want to try this. I want to see how well it could work. Cause, cause getting in, my volunteers, they, whatever pe whatever laptop they have will work, right? Cause all you need yeah. to be able to do is to RPC into a machine. Yeah, that's and exactly right. I, I can get I can get your client that works on any machine, right? You know that's easy. That's so, right. Yeah. But, uh, so we'll be doing that tomorrow. Uh, or, well. I might be doing it tomorrow. I need to do a little more reading uh, tonight, which I do have a user group tonight, so I, we'll see how, how much reading I get tonight. Uh, but then the other announcement, uh, so tomorrow I will be on Code It Live, uh, twitch.tv slash Code It Live. Uh, so Sam Basu is going to interview me as part of a uh, community, uh, uh, community showcase. So really looking forward to that. That's one of the things I miss about not traveling, seeing people like Sam. Uh, so, uh, I don't know if you know Sam Basu, who works with uh, Telerik. No, uh, I, I, I think I'm, I might have seen him talk or, or you know, at a, at a meeting, but never really mm -hmm. connected. Yeah. So, yeah, it's, that's one of the things I miss, right, is, is seeing all the speakers you see all, you know, Sam would be one of those guys I would see at least once a month, right, because we, we get the same conferences together, right? Sure. Uh, yeah. So it'll be a lot of fun, you know, uh, so that'll be 10 o'clock Eastern. That, that'll be going on. So, well, great. Well, again, right. so, uh, now let's... I don't know how much you're used to uh, Twitch, but in Twitch, what we normally do is we'll raid another channel. Um, ah. It's funny. Some people really take this really seriously, and they'll have, like, alarms going off. Other people are like, yeah, someone's raiding me. 
Um, let's see. I see. The, okay. Well, we'll go to our normal code rush, which Mark Miller with a uh, uh, Dev Express, which is he does a he gets a little bit crazy on his on his stuff. But uh, yeah. there we go. We we'll got that started. So, so everyone, I uh, again really appreciate uh, uh, you joining us today. Uh, Mike, I really appreciate you joining me today. It's been a blast. Um, and that's great. All right.